Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Friday night to come and see me. My name is Monica Valentinelli. Um, I am the guest of honor for Robocon. In terms of my work, I would prefer not to give you my resume. Um, you can check out my website. It's at booksofm.com, and that's as far as I want to take that because I have a really exciting topic to talk to you about today. Um, it's about how to attract and retain new players. And right before we got started, I asked you what types of games you were interested in. And a couple of you mentioned LARP, many of you mentioned tabletop, and a few of you mentioned board and card games, which is really fantastic. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is what is a new player, okay? And this is, this is a very important question because a new player isn't necessarily what you think. Sometimes people think, oh, new player, they've never played role-playing games before. Well, that's true, but a new player is somebody that never played that style of game before, that theme of game before. Um, they could also be, uh, yes, they can be new to playing completely, but they could also be new to playing your game. And the reason why this is important, it's because frame of reference. So for example, um, I worked on the Firefly RPG and one of the questions that I had was, well, what, who is a new player for the Firefly RPG? And it turns out we had a lot of answers to that question. It was somebody who saw the television show. It was somebody who played the Serenity RPG, but they didn't play the Firefly RPG. So there's all of these different answers that we had. The reason why those answers are important is because that informs who your audience is. And because that informs who your audience is, you then think about building something in marketing, it's called personas. Um, a persona is a, it's an imaginary character that you come up with and you think about what this person is like. So you imagine this person in your mind, this is the new player that you want to attract. It could be one persona or it could be multiple. And you think about it and you're like, well, one of the personas that I want is somebody who really likes, uh, say I was working on a dinosaur RPG. Somebody who really likes dinosaurs. Okay, great. So fans of dinosaurs. So what would that person be like? Somebody who's interested in science. Maybe they like these particular types of movies. Maybe they played similar games in my genre. And as you build the personas, what you find is that you start identifying where your competition is coming in. Because then you're seeing all of the other dinosaur games that are out in the market. And then you start attaching your personas as a frame of reference to these other games so that you build off of one another in cooperation. Um, another thing that happens a lot with new players, and this is, this is often true of new designers, Oh my gosh, my fans, they're only my fans. They will never play any more games. That's not true. <laughs> um, people who really like to play games play a lot of games. And as game designers, it's in our best interest to be passionate about each other's games. So I like Cthulhu. Um, I haven't written a lot of Cthulhu role-playing games. I've written Cthulhu stories, but I haven't really written a lot of Cthulhu games but I've worked on this other stuff. So if somebody comes up to me and I'm at a con or in a gaming store and they say, Monica, what kind of Cthulhu game would you recommend? I would say, well, what is your playing experience like? What, how, how have your um, experiences informed your decision? Like I would go through these different questions. So first we have the persona of the typical character or the typical person who's gonna buy your game. Then out of that, you come up with a list of five to 10 questions. Uh, these questions in marketing are often called leader questions or feeler questions, where instead of thinking about how you're selling to them, you wanna get to know them better. And here's the fun part. Once you come up with those personas and those questions, that's when you start talking to people. Um, another thing that often happens with personas is that some people think they only need the one that a new player is only one type. And I would say that um, that is no longer the case. 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago, that might've been the case. But in games, we have so many games now. We have more games 
now than it published ever before. But because publishing has changed, the dynamic is we no longer have 5 million copies of a game being sold unless it's Dungeons and Dragons. So all of the other games, it's maybe 300 here, 1,000 here, 5,000 here. Um, they're split up between crowdfunding and game stores and whatnot. So people are finding games in different ways. And because of that, as publishers, as game designers, as GMs, we have to go where the people are to find out how they're learning about our games, but also to get them interested in what we're doing. And sometimes that can be very challenging. Um, the question is, how do you do that? Well, people buy based on emotion. They don't buy based on intelligent game design. Um, what they want is an experience where they feel welcome. And in gaming, that is what we do. We sell experiences and the potential for experiences. So when I run a convention demo and I'm thinking about new players, that demo is gonna be different than it is if it's for experienced players. Because experienced players are looking for something very different. New players don't wanna feel stupid. They don't want to get something wrong. They're very shy, even in the States, trust me. Even in the States, they're very shy. Oh my gosh, what dice do I roll? I don't know what dice to roll. So then they don't want to make a mistake. And because they don't want to make a mistake, often they don't participate in demos unless the demos specifically say new player friendly for that reason. Um, and I find that very interesting because it talks a lot about the social contract because gaming has the social contract at the table. It is easier for people to try a game that they've never had if they can see themselves in the game, which is why one of the biggest ways to attract new players is to introduce them to a game that they're already familiar with um, in terms of a TV show or a movie, or you would introduce them into something that they like. So instead of just talking about your game, you would say, um, let's get back to dinosaurs. So say I want to make this dinosaur game. And this person is looking at all these games and they're like, oh, I don't know what I want to do. And I would say, well, what do you like? And then they would tell me. They say they want fairies. They say they want these other sorts of things. And I would say, well, my game is about dinosaurs. But if you like fairies and this is your first time role playing, how about I tell you about Changeling or Shadowrun or, and I give them different types of games. And what I'll do is I'll give them a spectrum from very narrative driven and very heavy to very rules heavy. Or I'll ask them a very important question, which is very good for me, uh, which is, so what games have you already had fun with? What games do you like to play now? Their answers will tell me how to sell my game to them. Because if I am trying to sell them a game about dinosaurs, and it's not catching, but they tell me, I like to play Savage Worlds. Oh, you do? Well, this system feels a little bit like Savage Worlds, but it's a lot more like Fate. So I give them a frame of reference that way and talk to the language that they're already familiar with, particularly because they don't feel stupid because that's very important. They want to feel like they're the center, that they're the star in this demo. Um, another really important thing with new players is that they like to be the center of attention. And I feel that that's very important because it only takes one bad experience gaming for people to get turned off from gaming and not play again. Um, I have talked to so many people. I had a bad GM. Um, I had a bad experience at the gaming store. I had a bad experience here, and then they never play again. And to prevent that, the people that are trying to attract and retain players almost have to become advocates for not only for themselves and for the games that they're doing, but think about it more as a community. To be an active member of the community in the sense of, well, okay, this person might not buy my game now, but again, people based on emotion. A lot of people, if they say, I don't know how I feel about this right now, and you're not super aggressive about it, and you're like friendly, and you're like, okay, well, here's, you know, I hope you enjoy the show, go out and check these other games, and then they come back to you. What's fascinating about it, I've gotten more sales on that than I have by giving them a hard sell. So just by being friendly and conversational and making them feel welcome. 
Um, I do want to talk about representation for a little bit. So I have been in gaming for a long time. Um, when I first started in gaming in 2002, I was running a lot of convention demos. And the convention demos were fascinating to me because I had more female t players at my table than the male GMs did. And all of the female players told me afterwards, I did not feel comfortable. I'm a first time role player. I did not feel comfortable because a male GM was at the table. Now, that conversation has somewhat changed, but not entirely. People go where they feel welcome. So in order for them to feel welcome, sometimes you have to create the space where they feel welcome. And that means in my games, I'm really big on representation. I want to make sure I have different characters of different genders, of different backgrounds, of different races, because people as players, they want to see them in most games, they want to see themselves as the hero, because that's the reason why they play. So if they can't experience that in a demo, then they're going to be turned off because they're going to internalize that something is wrong with them, that they can't be the hero. Again, it goes back to, I don't want to feel stupid. I don't want to feel wrong. And if they feel well and they get very excited and they care what the system is, they're not going to care what all the fiddly bits are. They're just having fun. And that is the emotion that drives the games for sales. Um, Something that changed recently is, okay, so we have this internet culture. Anybody been on the internet? <laughs> yes, okay. So in the internet culture, it's very challenging to figure out who the personas are. The majority of people that buy games are not going to be the ones that are going to engage with you. They are going to be the silent customers. That is the largest customer base of the people that buy your games. The people that engage with you on the internet are what we call super users. They're the people that are on the internet all the time, or even a vast majority of the time. Um, mobile phones, the rise of mobile phones interactions has increased exponentially. So when you hear about words like, this person is an internet troll, um, internet trolls is not a new player. It's not somebody who's probably ever gonna buy your game. Or if they are going to buy your game, that's one sale, that's one person that is very toxic to the community and he's driving out, he or she is driving out new players. And what's really fascinating about that is because all of the silent people are there, you don't know how they're making decisions because they are turned off by the toxic community members and they don't want to engage because they don't, again, it goes back to that, they don't feel welcome. So when somebody doesn't feel welcome, they, have, they go through this decision-making process. Who can I play with? Are they friendly? If I don't have anybody to play with, why would I bother? So having toxic communities is very, unfortunately, very detrimental to new players because either they don't know about those communities online or they don't have any other place to go to talk about their games. And again, it's because gaming has a social component. They need places to go to talk about their games. But if they go on a place that's a forum that's not moderated, uh, 4chan, I, actually I, don't, I can't speak to that authoritatively because I don't know what 4chan's current moderation policies are. Um, but if they go to a forum and it's not moderated very well and they jump in for the first time and they get attacked because they get something wrong or they're asking a question, oh my gosh, what do they do? They stop playing. They, most of the time they just stop playing. Um, why is it so hard to talk to new players? It's because we are the experts. If you have been playing role-playing games for a long time, you know exactly how to play a role-playing game. And because of that, it becomes very challenging to try to talk to somebody who's just started to get into it, almost impossible. So the question is, how do you talk to them about role-playing games? Well, you find the games that are good for new players. Um, uh, anybody here heard of the game called Gloom? Gloom, Atlas Games, awesome, awesome. I have introduced more people and talked to them more about what role-playing is by using that game than I have a regular RPG. Because they understand there's a story on the card, I have characters, it's my family, I get to do naughty things to them, they get to die. Um, 
I get to do nice things to your family. So it's off the bat. It's not competitive. It's not the normal. I punish you. I do good things for me. It's completely reversed. I have introduced everybody from 10 years old to 90 years old into role playing, playing this game. And when they have that fun experience, then they say, oh my gosh, this is such a great game. What other games do you have for me to try? And then they think about it as a menu. They start going down the list of samples. And when they think about samples, do you know what they're going to look for? Quick starts. Quick starts, adventure dem demos, um, they're also called jump starts. Basically, self-contained adventures are so important to getting new players because everything they need to play a game and try it is there, but it's also risk-free because they don't have to spend $50 on a core book. Instead, they spend $20 or less, uh, US, not Euro, sorry, um, $20 or less to get a demo, and they have everything they need. The characters are there. They don't have to worry about drawing up characters. The adventure is there, the story is there, everything is there. That really helps them make that decision whether or not to make that adventure. And in marketing, we call this, um, it, it's essentially a funnel technique. So the funnel idea is you throw your net very wide to get all of these people. But as they start, you pull your net tighter and tighter, but every single time you do, you give them something else. And by yay not only new players, but loyal fans, loyal new players who really enjoy what you're doing because they feel like you have their best interests at heart. Um, there is nothing worse than being in a game where you don't feel welcome, but also fans nowadays have so many decisions for how many games they buy and how many companies they go to. The ones that go the extra mile to say that they care end up creating and retaining these new players as customers. So they become the experts that you are right now. So then they get excited. And when they get excited, they start grabbing new players. A really good example of this in a non-role playing game context is Pokemon Go. How many of you have played Pokemon Go? I'm a Pokemon Go player, T-Beller, um, <laughs> right? How many of you have taught other people how to play? Raise, see? a really good portion of the audience. And that's because you had fun doing it. We can do the same thing in role-playing games. But in order for us to do that, we have to have the tools available. So what I'm suggesting is that part of it is we have to learn how to talk to each other. Recognize that the biggest player group is not gonna be the ones that are very vocal online. They're not going to be the ones calling people names, arguing about what year this game came out. Um, people that do that are very passionate about their role-playing games, but the majority of the audience will not know that information. Okay, so I talked about, uh, so again, <laughs> a troll is not a persona. And the thing that we have to do, both as game designers and if we're in the community, is listen. And listening is the hardest skill to learn because it requires some humility. It requires some humility to say, I don't know everything there is to know about what it's like to be a brand new role player in 2017 because I came into the hobby 20 years ago or 10 years ago or 30 years ago. And your experiences are going to be so much different than they are now. Um, a really good example of this is why sales of role-playing games and games and stuff have gone up, not only because of a recession, but because there's these online stores called Amazon. <laughs> People don't have to go into a gaming store anymore to buy games. They can go to an online store like DriveThruRPG or Amazon or some of these other places and just buy the thing that they want and never have to interact with somebody. So if they they, they don't have, and that's really safe for a lot of people. That's also safe for a lot of underrepresented voices. Because um, I'll give you an example in comics. I, uh, I used to read Spawn. I used to read Medieval Spawn and Witchblade. And um, I used to go into comic book stores a lot. But every single time I had to go, if I moved into a new city or had to go into a new comic book store, I, had, I would have to explain all over again, Yes, I'm a fan of these comics. Yes, I know, you know, Medieval Spawn, blah, blah, blah. And, and it felt very, um, almost like defense. You would have to defend your right to be in the store, defend your right to be able to play these games. That is a way that people get turned off. The, um, 
uh, what's the phrase, fake geek girl, right? So if people feel like their emotions aren't valid, it's a huge turnoff. Well, what happens when the internet comes on? Oh my God, I don't have to talk to anybody again. I can order milk and cheese, which is an independent comic. It's very rare. Um, I don't have to order any of these, you know, I don't have to talk to anybody more. I don't have to prove what I know about these comics. I can just order them and buy them and love them and consume them and maybe review them. Um, the people that are commenting are taking the extra step to, you, do, to do the feedback because they've already been through the process of I enjoy this or I don't enjoy this or I have criticisms. So that's an extra step that they're taking, but that's not what most people do. Um, so the internet has changed things. So one of the things that I really recommend is um, testing broadly. Okay, so what do I mean by testing broadly? Uh, I brought that up a little bit earlier. When you test broadly, you have to think about people that are playing the game that are not like you, that don't look like you, that don't like your friends, they don't um, have your background, maybe even the economics background, and they don't have the ability to make the same choices that you do, especially with time. Games can be very time intensive. A lot of demos are great because they're not time intensive. Um, some of them are an hour. I really like convention demos that are between two and three hours. I think four hours is too much for a convention demo. That's my personal feeling. Um, you bring them in, you give them this wonderful experience, they come away, you always give them something to come away with. If they have further questions, they can ask you. Again, it's all about creating that experience. But doing that to test broadly ends up being very difficult because it requires you almost to be like a photographer. You are taking a step back and you are looking at the broader community and you're also looking at what you can do to connect with other people who are like you. Um, one of the things that I find really positive is that if you find people that are very aggressive or very knowledgeable about their game, I mean, anybody know any Tolkien fans, <laughs> right? You know, Tolkien fans, they know everything there is to know about Aragorn and all of his 75,000 names. Um, so how do you get that person to back down? You ask them questions. Believe it or not, the same techniques that you get to attract and retain new players are the same techniques that you get assholes was I supposed to say that? Uh, to back down. When you ask someone and they, they come back and they're like, well, blah, blah, blah. Aragorn is not supposed to have that color of the sword. It's supposed to actually be blah, blah, blah. And it's supposed to be pronounced blah, blah, blah. You would say, wow, you really know a lot about Aragorn. First of all, you acknowledge what they know. Then the second thing you say is, how would you describe that to somebody who doesn't know anything about Aragorn? And then your experts will tell you how to talk to your new players. So in a way, they become the, it, it becomes an informational loop. And when the experts feel vested, sometimes they'll take a step back and be like, wow, wait a minute. You mean I have to explain this to somebody? I didn't even think there was anybody out there that didn't know anything there was to know about Aragorn, because I know everything. And that happens a lot. It also happens in game design with the rules. Um, I have a personal pet peeve. My pet peeve is I really don't like to read uh, card and board game instruction books because often they're not written for new players um, because they are so familiar with the game by the time they get to the point where they write that rule book. It's really, really hard for me to read it without like picking apart every word, trying to figure out, okay, how does this game actually work? Uh, YouTube, different, using different mediums to teach games, Fantastic, podcasts, YouTube, etc. Even having these from your own groups is a way to get new players because you're using a way for them to watch you and they will then come to you and maybe even say, oh, I saw you on YouTube or I saw you on this and you ran this game and I thought it was really interesting. Um, but again, being open to those questions is so important. So I have thrown a lot of information at you. And what I would like to do is hear some of your questions because I'm seeing some confused looks <laughs> and other looks are like, yeah, and other looks are like, oh my gosh, I have some questions. So I would like to see how, um, if you have any questions for me, not only just in the how to attract and retain new players, but if you have examples or problems, I'm happy to hear to basically act as your personal consultant. And I think together that will be the best way 
to talk about attracting and retaining new players, especially since your culture is going to be different from mine. Because um, there's there's definitely some things unique about Finn's culture that are, that are different from uh, American culture. Um, so if it first of all, does anybody have? Can we can we get? Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Uh, <laughs> it, it works. So so uh, talking about the industry in general because. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a game designer in the mobile game industry, and I'm interested in the industry in general. Awesome. Uh, but it's, it's very hard to get any data out of how the, how the yes. tabletop role-playing game industry actually works. Okay. So in terms of, of new players, what can you say about how many new players are we actually getting in like as, as a hobby? Or sometimes it feels like we are the same guys, at least in Finland. So the LARP scene is attracting new players, but the, but the tabletop scene, the, the average age is actually getting up and up every year. A little by little. So, so how much are we getting new players, and which games are pulling people in? How does that work in a broader scene? Okay. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, about that. So, the, so the question was, uh, you wanted some numbers behind the new players, or a feeling, or a feeling. Of, of, okay. It, so, are, are we so growing? Here's, here's, here's I, I'm going to throw some nerdy stuff at you, if that's okay. Uh, that's that's totally fine. All right. Um, so, this is true in tabletop. Uh, it is true in comics. It is true in traditional publishing. Nobody knows, and I will tell you why. Um, so I used to work in internet marketing, online marketing, and every website has its own way of collating visitors and visits and data. Um, on the sales back end, there are multiple ways to track customers, sales, visits, etc. Because the data is not standardized, and because retailers are not. Uh, because of privacy laws, they do not release the information. We actually have no way of knowing how many new customers we get because some of that information is regulated to privacy law. So I know for a fact, because I used to work for the internet, uh, I used to work for a consulting firm and we worked a lot with the Internet Retail 100, um, what every single sale, sales cycle looks like on a website. But again, the back end data is often so customer specific that they are looking at how to retain and attract customers just for their site. So they don't, um, they don't do a lot of outside referrals because that hurts them. They want to keep people on their site or they want to get people in, make the quick sale and off as fast as possible. So that in particular is something we don't have. We do know technology usage because we know that people are reading more on their mobile phones. Um, for novels, for example, and for a lot of uses, um, with the decline or the defunding of libraries, with the change in print media, we know that p we know that some sales of like the Nook and the Kindle and whatnot are actually changing or declining, and people are increasing their usage of their mobile phone because they don't have to buy a separate device because it's cheaper to read it on the phone. So some of it is related to the technology that they're using. Um, RPGs are still very cost intensive to make, especially with the art and with the way that they're presented. So we only have the book sales. Well, the book sales, the way that they're tracked, um, is all over the map because you have Amazon, which is one method, uh, not necessarily a method, but it's specific to that retailer. But then you also have the regular industry. Well, the regular industry numbers are unique to that industry, the drive through RPG numbers are, uh, drive through RPG is a very big seller of digital games. That's unique to that. But it's very hard to get the new customer data without bridging those privacy gaps. Um, where we know people come in on is two things. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons, it's still the 800 pound gorilla, and anything TV movie related. And it's because, seriously, uh, it's because it is so easy for me to teach a game if somebody already knows the character they're going to play. Character creation is the number one issue with attracting and retaining new players. If the character creation is longer than a certain point, the people that aren't vested in, in that, building that character will tune out and they won't go through with it anymore. Uh, I, I am a big fan of multiple forms of character creation for that reason. One of the things uh, I did in the Firefly RPG is I had the main cast, which was a given, and then we had original characters, but then I also wanted archetypes. So I came up with archetypes or templates for characters that you might find anywhere in the verse, 
And that allowed me to not only show the setting, but to have it be very diverse and representative. But it was very easy for people to say, oh yeah, I want to play a mechanic. And then you would have you know, this type of a mechanic and you would have kind of like this sample background. That's easier for people because you're giving them options. But character creation is the number one thing that gets new players in. Um, I would say that uh, it has to be connected to the demos in a way that's accessible to them. But if it goes over 15, 20 minutes, no. Um, I'm, in, I'm gonna tell you a joke, no offense to my old GM. Um, uh, the first time I played Pathfinder 3.5, they're lovely people, they do great stuff. Um, the character creation, we were already into it for half an hour, and my attention span is very short. And uh, we were getting to the point where I had to pick familiars, and there was all different kinds of familiars for my character. There was a Velociraptor, there was a shark, uh, <laughs> you know, there were all these different characters. And I didn't know where we were playing the game, and I didn't know what my player was going to be doing. So I looked at the list, and I said, can I have a Velociraptor? I really want a little mini dinosaur. No, you can't have that. That's not the type of game we're playing, right? For a new player, no is always bad. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, and that wasn't a slam on him at all. I was being, yeah, I was joking with him. I was being intentionally sarcastic. And then the shark came up, and I was like, I really want a shark. And he goes, well, if you can tell me how it's going to work in the game, maybe you can have it. And I said, well, very easy. We just get a bag of holding, and we put an ocean in it. <laughs> so the shark can just, every time I need to use them, pops up, and that, that ended character creation. Um, <laughs> so um, it's, it's very challenging in the sense that everybody's trying to figure out that question. But... Dungeons and Dragons, the Renaissance 5th edition, has done more for role-playing games, in my personal opinion, uh, than any other game has in the last five, 10 years. Um, crowdfunding has also been a really accessible way to get new players, but they are doing an amazing job just getting different people to play the game that are already interested in it. And when you have celebrities playing Dungeons and Dragons, people are like, oh my god, What's going on? I can't believe this action star really likes to play Dungeons and Dragons. Then um, they feel that it's more acceptable, and then they'll start playing. Um, but Dungeons and Dragons tends to be the first role playing, and then they'll try something else. So. Thank you. I know I kind of I do that. I, I wander. Uh, do we want to pass the mic around? Would you Would you care to pass, pass the mic to the gentleman in the red shirt? Thank you. Well, you're pointing. You're going like oh, this. Okay. Okay. And you're wearing red. All right. Thank you. I like red. That's good. Um, hello. Hello. Um, what you said about the, um, the kind of like the new players kind of kind of stuck me because my personal experience is that like experienced role players, they actually know quite well what they are looking for already. They know yes. what kind of a setting, they know what kind of a system, and they, they know quite well what they want. So it's pretty easy to say that this is this is for you, right? Yeah. Um, but then the new players, they're kind of like, they just they just don't know anything, right? Right. And, and I find that kind of like the hardest to, to sort of tackle. And then you gave pretty good examples there on, on how to do that. So, you know, what are you playing? Do you, want, do you want me to give you a couple more? Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to go. So if you have any more sort of these ideas on how to pitch, how to sort of figure out what are the guys after and, and things like that, that would be appreciated. Okay, all right. So some more examples of, uh, more specific examples of how to get, okay. So, um, so new players don't know what to do. Uh, so I'm going to tell you some t techniques that I do um, that... I not only do during character creation, so this is more like when you get, are you talking about before they sit down to play the game or kind of like during the game? Yeah, before, kind of before like attracting. Game? I know that at least when I'm pitching to, to some of my friends and at, at least the latest one that came up with was that I, a, a friend of mine who hasn't been you know, playing role playing games ever in his life was that, okay, so you've been doing this thing for like X years now, you go to Ropecon and all this stuff. <laughs> So, so what is this the shit that you're doing? And I kind of want to, you know, have this maybe. What, what is it? I'm not sure I would describe it as shit, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. That's okay. But then I'm having a hard time kind of like then quantifying it. And then he's like, okay, so, you know, if I want to start, where do I go? What do okay. I do? And then these kind of. So things. what type of game? Uh, so are you talking about you want to try to explain Robocon to somebody new or role-playing game to somebody new? 
Yeah, role playing games in general role for somebody new, general, and then try to okay. get them in, and then try to you know give them proper recommendations of, on on where to start. Okay, awesome. Okay, so, um, so there um, there is a generation of players who like Harry Potter. I know that's scary. I mean, nobody likes Harry Potter, right? Um, that was a joke, by the way, in case anybody gets really mad at me when I'm streaming. I like Harry Potter. You know, totally Team Ravenclaw. Um, the, the first question that I ask them sometimes is, uh, so do you like Harry Potter? Right? A lot of Harry Potter fans did RPing back in the day. They call it RPing. The interesting thing about RPing is it's really just diceless role playing. That's all it is. They come up with their own organic rules in the forums without having a DM or a GM, and they do all of the things that a regular role-playing game does. It's role-playing. So sometimes I ask them if they've RP'd before, and I use that word. Oh, do you like Harry Potter? Or, you know, have you RP'd before? I ask them what they've done, because once I know what they've done, I can better explain it. If I don't know what they've done, it's very hard for me to give an informed answer, okay? Um, the other thing that those questions do is it helps the person feel more vested in the conversation. And how many of you tune out after, you know, how many of you have a very arrogant friend who knows everything? Right? Couple? Okay. How many of you tune out after five minutes and your eyes start rolling back in your head, right? You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this person is still talking, but I'm too polite to say shut up. Um, that's what happens in these conversations is this person is trying to get a very quick answer from you. And if they don't know anything about role playing, sometimes you can't give them the quick answer because they're not going to get it. And if they don't get it, then they're, again, it goes back to feeling stupid and feeling wrong. So the first thing I do is I, I kind of want, well, you know what? That's a really good question. I want to answer it in the best way that I can for you. So I'd like to learn a little bit more about you. Like, have you had experiences with RPing? Um, have you heard the term cosplay before? Um, some people like to use the term improv theater. Uh, there, I will say that there's a bunch of talk about terminology. So the other thing that turns off a lot of new players is too much setting or too many terms. It's, it's one of instantly guaranteed to turn them off. Because if they have that much stuff to learn just to sit down and play the game, they're going to get so adverse to playing it because they know they're going to screw up. Because they're not going to remember seven different ways or how many other different ways there were to say the name Aragorn, you know? Um, and that's not because the work itself wasn't good. That's not a reflection on the work. It's a reflection on how we remember things. If we didn't work on something and we're learning it for the first time, and you come up with a bunch of terms, oh yes, this is the, instead of saying critical hit, you know, this is the explosion point, uh, you know, you come up with all these fancy terms that nobody has any idea what you're talking about, they have to learn those terms on top of playing the game. And often that is a different learning curve than just learning how to role play. So when you talk about uh, examples of games, the things that I like to do is pick very simple games because the simpler the game, the faster it is for people to build up their confidence to be able to do things. Um, the, a really good game for that is I, I personally feel is Fiasco. Because in Fiasco, if your character dies, you keep going. It's one of the few games where if you die, you keep going. Because you have all of the rounds and it's very equivalent. Um, fiasco, uh, anybody familiar with Fiasco? Yes, okay, all right, I'm getting a lot of, I didn't want to drop a na game that nobody knew, but um, the other thing about Fiasco is it has this collaborative aspect to it. There are some board games too that work really well to introduce people to role playing games. Munchkin. Um, I worked for Steve Jackson Games, I was the marketing director for them, and I also worked with John Kavalik for a little while. And Munchkin was originally created as a parody of Dungeons and Dragons. So if you can find a flavor of Munchkin, and there are many, <laughs> and there are many, many cards for Munchkin. And if they sit down and they like that, you could say, well, how did you feel about that? And they're like, well, I didn't like to be backstabbed. You could say, 
would you like it to be more a team-based experience? And then maybe they will try Dungeons and Dragons or something in that genre, or they will tell you what they like and they didn't, and then you can recommend something for them. I'm a big fan of getting very personal with recommendations, um, but I think that sometimes styles of play have to come out of people feeling excited about trying new things. There's some people that love Dungeons and Dragons first edition. There are some people that hate Dungeons and Dragons for the first edition. Um, that's okay, right? But to be able to recommend a lot of different games, sometimes we have to be open to different playing styles, and different playing styles can be very hard to learn without asking those questions. So, did I do okay? Did I answer your question? Yes? Right. Everybody's smiling at me. Maybe I'm part Finn, I don't know. Um, did you wanna? Couple more minutes left. Did you want more questions? Oh, you had a question. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I did a quick um, search here for <coughs> numbers of the smallest category of hobby games. Uh, role playing grew forty percent from twenty five million in twenty fourteen to thirty five million in twenty fifteen. Uh, that's where are numbers. those numbers from? They are from ICV two. So, ICV2, so that's American numbers. Yeah. ICV2 only counts hmm. those numbers in specific venues. So that is not everything. That, no. is, a, that is a slice of the yeah. data. It's still, it's an optimistic uh, yes. growth curve, which is yes. nice. But my, my second question is, uh, of course, Dungeons and Dragons, how about streaming and the, uh, the increasing trend to do performative role playing online as videos? Uh, what's the role of that in gaining new players? What, do you have any interesting tips on how to utilize that when, when trying to attract new players? Um, there's been a lot of debate about that. Um, there's been a lot of debate about that because there are some long-term fans that are, I wouldn't necessarily say adverse, but their criticism or their concern, I guess I would consider it to be more of a concern than a criticism, is that uh, performative role playing is great because it turns the people that are playing those roles into performance artists. But sometimes what happens is they're worried about how the game designer and the people working on that game are affected by it. Um, and some of that I think is because in the RPG industry, our industry is so tiny mm. that designers and whatnot, they tend to interact with the fans one on one. So there's, it's an interesting conundrum because when I think of performative role playing, I almost think about it, it, it's treated the same as a license. It's treated the same thing as a TV show or a movie. In my head, that's the way that I have categorized it. Okay, that may not be correct. Um, however, that's how I treat it. And the reason why I treat it that way is because here are a bunch of professionals, and they are professionals, they're professional actors or people that do this. And what they're doing is they are basically light, um, even if it's a free license, they're basically taking the content, they're translating it into a different form, and they're performing it for the audience. Now some of the audience may play the game, a lot of them are, it's a good way of boosting awareness, I don't know how many new players are going to come out of that. Because they are going to get more invested in the characters that are already there, like a TV or a movie show. So then they become attached to those characters. Then the question is, where is the hook? How do you get the new player? To get the new player, you have to invite them on the show. Um, I am a big fan of uh, performance where it's collaborative. So if you have, uh, say you have a troupe. Say you have, um, I can run games for a lot of players, it depends upon the system, but say on television, the average troupe might be five players, okay? I would always leave two spots empty. I would have my GM, uh, who would be either rotating or a couple of people that are already known. So the GM by themselves is not performing. Okay, so if, if in terms of those types of games, right? If it's a GM and then the players. Yep, I got it, one minute. We're, we're gonna answer the question and then we're gonna go uh, and answer. So I'm going to babble a little bit. Um, you guys are okay. okay. I'm in. Um, so then what I would do is I would have uh, the GM rotate. 
but I would also have maybe a player or two rotate because you need them invested in that experience. And then people might play the game just so they get a shot to be on the show. Um, if you have static players, I think that's actually worse. So. Uh, what do I need in quick start tools uh, if I'm offering free downloads or brochures? So what, where do you offer them uh, or what do you offer? Uh, on website. Uh, I, would, I would actually offer it on DriveThruRPG. Because that's where the, yeah. Uh, but what I would uh, put in the quick start was what, what do you put in a quick start? Okay, very quickly. I'm breaking the rules. Breaking the rules. Uh, very quickly, what you put in, a, what you put in the what quick is start. What needed? Yeah. So in a quick start, you need a minimum of six characters. Uh, usually, um, that's my personal preference. That's not always what I'm allowed to do, but that's my personal preference. Because you always want one more than, na than the average group will have. You want to make those characters very representative. I often use gender neutral names so that either, you know, different genders can approach those names. And they're fully statted up. You have the background, you have the motivations, but you also have hints on how they feel about each other. Very important for quick starts, you need to make sure that the characters have on how they feel about each other. Do not have any players in your quick start that are, I am the lone wolf. I just stand off to the corner and I never talk to anybody. Don't do that to new players. They can't play those characters. Um, even some experienced players can't play those characters, but um, those are bad characters for a quick start. Uh, and then um, what you do is, uh, I like to approach it as scenes. And then I like to time the scenes. So you have the watered down rules for how this game can be played. And then you come up with scenes and then options for how the scenes can go. And most scenes you will know that because there's decision trees. Um, and that's basically what goes in a quick start. So, so like 25 pages of rules and yeah. 30 pages of scenario roughly? Something like that? Yeah, 25 pages of rules, 30 pages of scenario. Um, yeah, roughly. It, it, it really depends upon the game. I mean. There are some games where I can just take index cards and uh, Cortex Plus, the system mm -hmm. that I worked on for Firefly, I can run an entire Firefly game based off of one sentence. You know, so so it just depends upon the system. But the quick, the best way to learn how to write a quick start is to look at the existing ones that are out there and also the ones that are well rated. So. Okay, so I can cut it off now. All right, thank you for coming. <laughs>